Marxism and Freedom by Rhea Dunayevskaya. This is part two, Worker and Intellectual at a Turning Point in History, 1848 to 1861. Chapter four, Worker, Intellectual, and the State. One, the 1848 revolutions and the radical intellectual. The 1848 revolutions covered Europe from end to end as the absolutist regimes fell and democracy seemed within reach of the masses, the middle-class leaders turned and ran. Today, it is admitted there would have been no revolutions in 1848 if it had deepened or depended on the revolutionary leaders. The revolutions made themselves, and the true heroes of 1848 were the masses. The radical intellectuals had supposed that once tradition was overthrown, the masses would acknowledge instead the claims of intellect. Nietzsche expressed later this great illusion of 1848. Dead are all gods. Now the Superman shall live. The masses never responded to the ambitions of the intellectuals. One of the most astute bourgeois minds of the 19th century, Alexis de Tocqueville, who left us a classic book, Democracy in America revealed sharply the crossroads which the French bourgeoisie had reached in 1848. A few weeks before the outbreak of the February Revolution, he seemed to predict it. Do you not feel the revolution in the air? He said in his famous speech before the assembly. Yet when it broke out and he was given credit for this prediction, he denied it. I did not expect a revolution like the one we had. He was right both times. He foresaw that the hunger and restlessness of the masses against the background of restored monarchical spending and debauchery would burst forth in revolt if concessions were not made to them by the, by the absolutist regime. But he thought electoral reform to be the need of the hour. His mind did not conceive that the workers would take to the streets, set up barricades and present an economic program in their own right not only against the king, but against the bourgeoisie. I do not believe the people, wrote this good bourgeois mistaking his class for the people, were ever so frightened at any stage of the great revolution, and I think their terror can only be compared with that of the civilized communities of the Roman Empire when they saw themselves in the hands of the Goths and the Vandals. The Goths and the Vandals, for de Tocqueville were the Parisian workers bearing arms. The discovery of irreconcilable class antagonisms made 1848 a turning point in modern history. Today, even bourgeois writers can see that 1848 opened the era of mass proletarian revolutions. But in 1848, only Marx saw the communist manifesto which reached the publishers just a few weeks before the outbreak of the February revolutions proclaimed all hitherto existing history to be the history of class struggles and it continued while the bourgeois bourgeoisie cannot live without revolutionizing methods of production and relations of production its greatest accomplishment was the forging of the revolutionary working class itself which would put an end to all class struggle the proletariat, the lowest stratum of our present society, cannot raise itself without the whole super incumbent strata of social society being broken up into the air. Working men of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. You have a world to gain. Not only had the bourgeoisie not conceived of a revolt against them, neither had the radical intellectuals who had aligned themselves with the masses before the revolution but were caught by surprise by the actual revolutionary uprising. Blenke had conceived a small, well-organized conspiratorial coup led by himself. Louis Blanc had talked of national workshops, but not, not of any revolution to achieve these. Proudhon had, had declaimed, or declaimed against the brazen law of wages, but most certainly did not advocate revolution to overcome wage slavery. Had the workers listened to their leaders, there would have been no revolutions in 1848. But with no parties, in the modern sense of the word, to lead or mislead, the revolutions made themselves. 
Thousands of workers and students appeared on the streets of Paris, demanding universal suffrage and organization of labor. This mass uprising that was without arms suddenly f found it had arms when events took another unexpected turn and the National Guard, instead of firing upon them, joined them. The king had no sooner fled and a provisional government set up when the bourgeoisie, who up to this point had not opposed the masses, counseled against setting up a republic by barricade might. The masses forced the proclamation of a republic. The creative energies of the masses, disciplined and united, which had created the republic, now demanded of that republic that it be a social republic and create work for all. Marsh, a worker, dictated the decree and now the masses were demanding the formation of a labor ministry. They took seriously their role in the revolution and in the reconstruction of society. In a few weeks, 171 newspapers appeared. Although the workers believed in this coalition, provisional government, revolutionary workers clubs sprung up all over Paris, 145 of them in the first month. Lamartine, the poet who joined the revolutionaries at the first outburst, did so, as he himself put it quite bluntly, to harness the storm. That defined the character and the limits of the provisional government. This newly created bourgeois government now turned against the economic demands of their proletarian allies. Lamartine conceived the idea that it was the government's function to remove the misunderstanding which exists between the classes. Socialist Louis Blanc, the workers' representative, accepted the compromise that a commission of labor be set up. The parliament became a talking shop, and the national workshops which were set up had allotted to them such a piquillon sum that they were no more than the charity workshops which England had long before experienced. Still, the unemployment and starvation were so severe in this year of crisis that no less than 110,000 workers streamed into these shops. The government hoped to turn this pitiable labor army into an army against labor. They badly underestimated the modern working class. When Parliament voted to expel the unmarried men from the shops and force them to join the army, they found this labor army an army of mutiny. The true essence of the 1848 revolutions was now revealed. It was the emancipation of labor. On June 23rd, the workers took up the challenge. Barricades were once again set up. The slogan now heard was, down with the bourgeoisie. We have Marx's description of this first great battle between the two classes. How the workers, with unexampled bravery and talent, without chiefs, without a common plan, without means, and for the most part lacking weapons, held in check for five days the army, the mobile guard, the Parisian National Guard, and the National Guard that streamed in from the provinces. So vast was the massacre and brutality committed by the bourgeois republic, but the bloodletting could not erase the accomplishments of those few months. One, abolition of slavery in the colonies. Two, abolition of the death penalty. Three, abolition of imprisonment for debt. Four, universal suffrage. Five, the 10 hour day. Neither could the defeat erase the greatest lesson. It is not the political form of the state that is decisive, but the rule of capital. Parliamentary democracy became synonymous, not with proletarian freedom, but with bourgeois butchery and wage slavery. Whereas universal suffrage proved to be no panacea it did have the great merit of unleashing the class struggle and robbing the bourgeois democrat of his hypocritical mask of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Marx hailed these revolutionaries and contrasted them to the socialist doctrinaires who begged at the doors of the bourgeoisie on behalf of the people and were allowed to preach long sermons and to compromise themselves as long as the proletarian lion had to be lulled to sleep. Even where he criticized their slogan, organization of labor, because wage labor is the existing bourgeois organization of labor, 
and that thereby they would only continue the form of wage slavery from which they were already suffering, he realized that what the workers meant essentially was the overthrow of this bourgeois regime. Indeed, this became evident in June. In fact, that was the greatest lesson of June. Whereas in February, the masses followed the bourgeoisie because what they were after was the overthrow of the form of state power, absolutism. In June, they fought the bourgeoisie, the capitalistic order, and fought it by their own great combined resources. Marx caught the essence and the spirit of the creative energies of masses when he recognized the workers had declared the revolution permanent, that is to say, not to stop at the bourgeois democratic phase, but to continue to full proletarian democracy. They placed themselves in violent contradiction with the very conditions of existence of bourgeois society by declaring the revolution permanent. Marx's discovery that the objective movement itself produces the subjective force for its overthrow transformed utopian socialism into scientific socialism. It drew a sharp class line between the intellectuals, utopians, who would continue with their schemes and the proletariat itself, which had now separated itself from these sects and was creating movements of its own. He warned later against any narrow-minded notion of the petty bourgeois leaders of this revolution as of the subsequent reaction. We must not imagine that the democratic representatives are all shopkeepers or enthusiastic champions of shopkeepers. According to their education and their individual position, they may be separated from them as widely as heaven from earth. What makes them representatives of the petty bourgeoisie is the fact that in their minds they do not go beyond the limits which the latter do not go beyond in life, that they are consequently driven theoretically to the same tasks and solutions to which material interests and social position practically drive the latter. This is, in general, the relationship of the political and literary representatives of a class to the class that they represent. The division between the creative energies of the masses, on the one hand, and the plans of the radical intellectuals, on the other, widened and deepened in the 1848 revolution because the proletariat had gained consciousness of itself as a class. On this independent road, the intellectuals would not follow. The radical intellectuals were forever planning to do something for the worker, substituting their activity, or at least planning, for the self-activity of the working class. At one point in history, following the French Revolution, this type of planning had the heroic proportions of Babeuf's conspiracy of the equals. By the 1840s, it had the pathetic shape of Proudhon's organization of exchange, while in the actual revolution of 1848, it had the anti-revolutionary stamp of Lamartine's joining to harness the storm. Whatever the forms they plan, and they will be myriad as we progress to our age, the radical intellectuals are blind to the creative energies of the masses. In opposing them and keeping his eyes glued instead to the activity of the masses, Marx was able to generalize their creative activities into a theory of liberation, never fooling himself that, a theor that theory is otherwise than ever gray while the tree of life is ever green. 2. Ferdinand LaSalle, State Socialist After the defeat of the 1848 revolutions, Marx returned to his economic studies. He kept away from the emigre circles. The quiescent 1850s ended in the financial crisis of 1857, and his work, A Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy, was published in 1859. During this period, some younger men came to scientific socialism, Marxism. Ferdinand LaSalle was the most important of these. LaSalle was born, in a political sense, at the turning point in modern history, 1848, when, for a brief historic moment, the fight against absolutism united the bourgeois democrat and the proletarian revolutionary. The 1848 revolution underlined, in rivers of blood, the irreconcilability of these two class forces. LaSalle appealed directly to the working class to form its own independent political party. Nevertheless, Marx had to separate himself sharply from this preserved pro perverse progeny of his. 
even as he had separated himself from the anarchist socialism of Proudhon. This was necessitated by the fact that where Proudhon tried for a compromise between the two classes, LaSalle tried for a shortcut to socialism through the state, through the Prussian landowners' absolutist state with the Iron Chancellor Bismarck at its head. It is not that LaSalle misunderstood the class nature of the state, but he could not rid himself of the, con of the concept of the backwardness of labor, despite the glorious pages it wrote in 19th century history. When the class struggles once again assumed open and violent shape, LaSalle conceived it to be his duty to bridge the gulf between the thinkers and the masses. From his attitude, one would guess that all the science of the age was incorporated in him and he would have to bring that science to the ignorant. In his defense, when on trial for inciting the masses, he revealed his special conception of the role of the intellectuals. How is it that the middle classes have come to be so frightened of the common people? Look back to Mar March and April of 1848. Have you forgotten how things were then? The police force impotent, the common people swarming along the streets, the streets and the people themselves under the sway of unthinking agitators, rough ignorant men thrown up by the storm. Where were the intellectuals then? Where were you, gentlemen? You should thank those who are working to bridge the gulf between the thinkers and the masses who are pulling down the barriers between the bourgeoisie and the people. Because this was his conception of the masses, LaSalle's theoretical concept of labor moved no further than the Proudhonian concept of the workers buying up all capital from the bourgeoisie. LaSalle proposed that the workers establish producers' cooperatives with state aid. Although this meant treating the Prussian absolutist state as if it were a classless animal, it isn't true that LaSalle actually thought so. However, once he did not believe in the masses' abilities to overcome their conditions of labor, and once he convinced himself that Marx was too abstract and failed to understand real politics because he did believe in the workers' historic creativity, it was easy for LaSalle to convince himself that he could force Bismarck to accede. LaSalle's sense of real politics also led him to search for a collaborator in the Royal Prussian Governmental Socialist and Economic Theoretician, Karl Rodbertis. He did at first actually get Rodbertis's approval for his plan of producers' cooperatives with state aid, although the latter's concept of how long the socialist transformation would take numbered no less than 500 years. LaSalle, on the other hand, wanted socialism quick, within the year if possible. Yet so strong are the organic ties between intellectuals who have a certain concept of labor that the impatient LaSalle and the overly patient Robertus were collaborators for a brief period. This representative of labor, however, was so armchair socialist, or was no armchair socialist. He was an activist, nor did he restrict himself to writing. He was instrumental in building the first great independent political party of the German proletariat. LaSalle's plan to bring pressure to bear upon the absolutist Prussian state to force it to give economic aid to the workers who would establish their own factories meant active agitation among the workers. He issued this appeal. The working class must, esta must establish itself as an independent political party and make its slogan and banner universal, equal, and direct suffrage to make the working class its own employer. That is the way, the only way, by which this cruel and iron law of unchangeable minimum wages can be set aside. Once the working class is its own employer, the contrast between wages and profit disappears. It is therefore the task of the state to facilitate the great cause. Thousands of workers responded to the call and the General German Workers Association was formally recognized in May 1863. In June, unbeknownst to the workers, it need hardly be added, LaSalle sent the statutes adopted to Bismarck with the following note. This will be enough to show you how true it is that the working class is instinctively inclined to dictatorship if it feels that such will be exercised in the working class interests. LaSalle was no traitor. He could not have been bought he fought for his principles, went to prison for them, and would have been ready to die for them. 
but he simply was incapable of thinking that they, the workers, could rule. To him, they were a mob. He thought so in 1844 when the Silesian weavers revolted. He was only a student then, but already he felt that the state should restore order. He did not change his concept when, in 1848, the workers were breaking up, not the machines, but the bourgeois order. He defended the working class victories, yet he continued to think of them as a mob under the sway of unthinking agitators, thrown up by the storm. Things did not change in 1862 when he himself called upon the masses to organize an independent political party of their own. His call was, however, inseparable from his aim to put myself at its head. The workers were suffering mass and weak, whereas the state was strong and could achieve for each one of us what none of us could achieve for himself. He therefore felt called upon to rule for the masses. He would lead. They would continue to work and in the meanwhile be so good as to send him to Parliament. His attitude, wrote Marx, is that of a future workers' dictator. He resolves the question between labor and capital as easily as play. The workers are to agitate for universal suffrage and then send people like himself armed with the shining sword of science into Parliament. They will establish workers' factories for which the state will put up capital, and by and by these institutions will embrace the whole country. Marx wrote this not because he knew of LaSalle's machinations with Bismarck, but because he knew of LaSalle's concept of the backwardness of labor. LaSalle suffered from the illusion of the age that science is classless. Such an attitude made it natural for him to think that he represented science and the worker. For science was surely incorporated in the, in the intellectual, the leader. Marx, on the other hand, rejected this puerile stuff as he rejected the bourgeois conception that this was the age of science and democracy, so he rejected the abstraction of science and the worker. Concretely, he stressed, science was incorporated in the machine, and democracy and the bourgeois parliament. LaSalle's conception of the worker's leader had this in common with the bourgeoisie. The workers remained in the factory. Between LaSalle and Marx, there was as deep a division in thought and in practice as in life there is between the petty bourgeois and the worker. The illumination that the 1848-61 to period sheds on the relationship of the worker and intellectual is to disclose the administrative type long before the administrators are armed with power. Where Proudhon showed that the separation between petty bourgeois and worker before the revolutionary outburst, LaSalle revealed the type after the revolutionary defeat. LaSalle was the living proof that within the revolutionary movement itself, the radical intellectual solution waits to strangle the theoretician who is blind to the creative energies of the masses. LaSalle was the anticipation of the state socialist administrator of our day.